The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Flight Bridge Ed MDCast. My name is Mike Loria. I'm an emergency EMS and flight physician currently in critical care fellowship and the medical director for Flight Bridge Ed. The MDCast is designed to bring high yield clinical pearls and mental models about treating these critically ill patients to you all in the field that you can apply at the bedside. Today, we're going to be talking about calcium and trauma. This has definitely become a very interesting and hot button topic in the world of trauma, kind of starting with a very interesting article published by Ricky Ditzel in the Journal of Trauma. Uh, It was entitled, A Review of Transfusions and Trauma-Induced Hypocalcemia. Is it time to change the lethal triad to the lethal diamond? Over the past several years, people have kind of picked this up and run with it, and uh, it has become a very interesting clinical question that people have been asking. And we see more and more trauma patients getting calcium. But I think the question remains, should all trauma patients be getting calcium? Should we just be empirically giving calcium to all trauma patients? To that, I would have to say probably not. I'm a healthy skeptic, but I would have to say probably not under those circumstances. And there, However, there is probably a subset of trauma patients that I think it's reasonable to give calcium to. Now, I think one thing that is very interesting is overall, uh, we, I, I do believe that there is a very clear association between low calcium and poor outcomes in trauma. But there's a lot of associations between things that don't necessarily mean that that thing in and of itself is causing the problem, and it helps to treat that thing. And so when it comes to this question of should we just be giving all trauma patients calcium, I think we have to consider a number of things. First of all, your body actually rapidly adjusts to calcium levels and quite effectively, as a matter of fact, if you think about it, the vast majority of calcium stores are in your bone. Less than about 1% or so is actually floating around in your serum and your body rapidly adjusts to those levels on its own. There's actually pretty good data going back to the 1970s showing that fluctuations, very significant fluctuations in calcium levels are essentially very quickly corrected by the body by releasing calcium from bone and very quickly being on the order of 5, 10, 15 or so minutes, which I think is very interesting. I talked to or actually heard a fantastic, fantastic talk at the Critical Care Transport medicine conference uh, by the illustrious Michael Frakes from Boston MedFlight uh, and did a very interesting review of the literature on the topic and also pointed out something that I've seen in clinical practice very, very commonly, which is there there is an association between low calcium and bad outcomes, but is it associated with poor outcomes because it's just a sign that there's some other metabolic derangement going on, some other problem that's just manifesting with low calcium. And we see this pretty regularly. It is true that somewhere around 50, 56% of trauma patients come in with a low ionized calcium, sure. And uh, But we see that in a lot of patients, not just trauma patients, more than half of the patients that are admitted critically ill to the ICU also have low ionized calcium. It doesn't mean that we give calcium to all those patients right off the bat, or at least start pushing calcium. And if you look at all the critically ill patients, both surgical patients, trauma patients, medical patients that come to you, the vast majority of them at some point during their ICU, more than about 80 to 88% actually develop hypocalcemia. And a not insignificant number of about 16% actually develop hypocalcemia calcemia instead of the studies. So when I see 
really poor outcomes associated with really high calcium and really low calcium um, that I think is really telling me that there's something else going on here that's driving the calcium up or down that's certainly a sign of badness, but it may not necessarily be the calcium level itself that's driving the problem, and it may not necessarily respond to supplementation or actually giving people extra calcium. And certainly giving people lots of extra calcium or having high calciums may not be really good either. Now the question always comes up of low and high calcium being bad, but also um, what's causing that in the setting of trauma specifically, is it actually us doing it? Are we actually giving people blood products that have citrate in it that binds calcium and drives those calcium levels down? And I think that's a very fair question because more and more as we're realizing the value of um, a balanced resuscitation and actually seeing more and more the value of whole blood in the setting of acute traumatic injuries for resuscitation, we should be asking questions like, "Is are we actually making this worse? Are we actually causing a problem that we need to supplement? And I think the answer is yes and no on this one. Um, by and large, your body can actually process quite a bit of, uh, of citrate very quickly. It does bind up calcium, um, but in the setting of massive transfusion, it may play a role. Otherwise, your body can actually metabolize uh, quite a bit of citrate, several grams over the course of, uh, of about five to 10 minutes. And what we see is that even after getting a unit of blood, your body's able to normally process that citrate and your calcium levels come up. However, however, and this is a big caveat here, is that that really wasn't necessarily studied in patients who are critically ill. Healthy patients are able to process that. Patients without liver problems, patients who haven't been shot and are bleeding to death. But that may not necessarily mean that really, really critically ill trauma patients can process that citrate appropriately. And it seems to be a function more than anything else of the rate of infusion or administration. And Michael Frakes point this, pointed this out in his talk at CCTMC uh, as well. So if you're jamming lots of blood into someone, so if we have them on a level one transfuser and you're putting in unit after unit after unit of blood products very, very quickly, it, it may actually be a, a very clinically relevant issue. And we should probably be giving them calcium. And the other thing is we commonly think about uh, giving packed red cells to people and having citrate in it as a preservative. But in fact, plasma actually has much more. So it may be reasonable as we're giving larger amounts of plasma or plasma first to patients who are bleeding to death to actually consider giving them calcium. That has yet to be determined. The other big question mark is if we are now giving more whole blood to patients, does that have the same effect on calcium levels as giving them different blood components with citrate in it? I think that's an interesting question that still needs to be answered. So those are several issues. There's still several more. Um, I think that one, one thing we can very clearly say both uh, in the field, in the emergency department, in the ICU, is you give someone an amp of especially calcium chloride uh, and their blood pressure comes up. Great. Those effects only last, uh, it's, it's very transient, so it usually lasts only about 10 to 15 minutes or so, and then it goes away, which is another sign that it may not be necessarily fixing the underlying problem. It always makes the numbers look better, but does it make the outcomes any better? And I think it's it's very difficult to say, and what I hear commonly is, we can just get, it's not going to do any harm, right? You can just give the calcium to people. Getting them a little bit of calcium is not necessarily a bad thing. Well, going back to the previous point that high calcium levels may also be bad, or at least high calcium levels are associated with worse outcomes. And also, I think what we're seeing in other patient subpopulations is it may be bad. So the COCA trial, looking at patients in cardiac arrest, looked at, it was a very well done um, randomized control trial that looked at giving empiric calcium to patients in cardiac arrest, and those patients didn't do so well. Furthermore, there were sub-analyses of those trials, and you would think because the 
main, one of the main treatments for patients that are hyperkalemic or have a cardiac arrest from hyperkalemia is to give them calcium, give them bicarb, give them insulin, dextrose, do all the stuff to treat hyperkalemia, right? Well, as it turns out, with patients that actually have a heartbeat, that's true. In cardiac arrest, that might not be true. So a sub-analysis, and granted it was a sub-analysis of the COCA trial, demonstrated that patients in cardiac arrest with electrocardiographic findings or suspicion for hyperkalemia, when they got calcium, they also did very, very poorly, and there was really no effect on them. So it seems that even if you have a hyperkalemic arrest, just giving hyperkalemia, giving calcium to patients may not be that helpful. So there actually, and in that data, there actually may have been a signal of harm in the original COCA trial for giving patients uh, calcium. Those patients did worse. So I think that it's not fair to say, oh, it's just a benign thing. We're just going to give them some calcium. What's going to, what's the worst that could happen? Finally, I think there's a there's a very true these days, especially logistical argument that giving calcium to people or using a resource when it may not be helpful is not the greatest thing. We've seen shortages of all types of drugs in the past five, ten years. Everything from normal saline to Ativan to all sorts of other drugs that are really causing problems sometimes because if we give it to someone without a clear indication, there may be a patient we go to pick up hours later or the next day, and if we've used all of the calcium, which I know is hard to believe, but again, we've had shortages of things as simple as normal saline, um, that patient may not get the benefit from it. So we have to make sure we're giving the right medications to the right patient at the right time. Now, after listening to this, you may think I'm a, I'm a calcium naysayer and that um, I am totally anti-calcium, and that is not the case. Again, my compliments to Ricky Ditzel and all of the other people that have come along and discussed these topics and are continuing to research it, and I think there's still a lot to be done. And there are some RCTs going on right now or getting ready to start that are looking at giving calcium to some of these patients, and I think that doing the prospective randomized controlled trial that looks at this may actually be beneficial to establish causation that the hypocalcemia is causing a problem and that treating it is actually helpful and improves mortality improves other outcomes that are patient-centered so now that i've demonstrated that uh i'm a healthy skeptic of giving calcium, people still ask me then, so do you give it, Mike? Do you actually recommend it? Do you uh, give it to any of your trauma patients? And the answer is yes, under some circumstances. So first of all, I will give it to patients who are peri-arrest, who I think I can actually, who I think it may be playing a role in, and it may be able to bring us back from the edge of cardiac arrest, especially in the setting of trauma, the survival rates in cardiac arrest, depending upon certain elements of the pathology and certain specific things is obviously very poor, right? Um, so if I see them starting to Brady down, if I see them profound, you know, suddenly become profoundly hypotensive, if they're peri-arrest, I'm like, this person isn't going to survive the next two minutes. Um, absolutely. I'm happy to give a little bit of calcium uh, if that can help put our finger in the dike, stave off cardiac arrest, and allow us to do the other evidence-based therapies to help this patient out. Two, if we're really jamming blood into someone, if I'm at an outside hospital and they're just dumping blood into someone, or if we're transferring or bringing a patient in from the field and we're giving them more than you know, three or four units, everything that's in our cooler, right? And I know some programs are carrying more than two units of plasma and two units of packed cells. Absolutely. Sure. I'll go ahead and give it to them. No problem. And finally, if there's really good documentation that their ionized calcium is less than eight or excuse me, 0 0.8, absolutely. I will go ahead and give it. So that's when I will give calcium. I think there's still some science that needs to be conducted in order to figure out if it's really the problem or not but until then i would hesitate to give it to everybody and keep it to those handful of situations that i suggested may be helpful so thank you guys and by all means go ahead and check out the list of references that we're going to post in here go to the literature yourself and draw your own conclusions and ask your own good questions 
because that's how we progress the science of emergency medicine, critical care, and of course, critical care transport. So everybody take care, be well, and fly safe. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education.